Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for coming. And uh, uh, just like to introduce ourselves, I'm Cliff Anderson. I'm the director for Scholarly Communications at Vanderbilt University. And this is Lindsay Fox. And our topic today is collaborating with students the open source way. Uh, and please, uh, if, I don't know if you can read that, but our Twitter handles are Anderson Cliff B and LCL Fox, if you want to send us uh, questions that way. Uh, but Lindsay, I'll turn it over to you to start. Hi guys, um, so I work as the GIS coordinator at Vanderbilt in the library system. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit today about our um, Dean's Fellow project that we have going on in the library. Um, this is a project that started in 2013. Um, and basically what it is, is a, it's a group of projects proposed by um, various library professionals. Um, and it's set up so that students are able to apply. It's, it's fairly competitive. Um, and they're able to work with library professionals to complete a project that um, adds a new type of skill set to their expertise. Um, it's something that they can add to their resume. Um, it's a paid, it's a sort of like a paid research assistantship. Um, it's open to um, upper level undergraduates and graduate students. Um, and since 2013, we've had about, let's see, 12 fellows, I think. Um, if I can count right, maybe 11. Um, and lots of different projects that vary across. Um, one of the ongoing ones we've had um, is the Wikipedia project. Um, it's an initiative to um, create more Vanderbilt Wikipedia pages. Um, and we've also had um, Recording History, Vanderbilt Impact Symposium. Um, and another big one was the TV News Archive. Um, we had students working with um, special collections and um, other digital groups in our library um, to create that archive. Um, the one I'm gonna be talking to you about today um, is the historical tour that we um, have created. Um, this project really arose out of a need to um, maintain some of the campus history. Um, our campus historian was retiring last year, so our uh, associate director of special collections and one of our associate deans came up with the idea to create um, a self-guided tour of campus. Um, each of these points has um, some interesting information about um, the location. It includes pictures, um, and it's really just built so that users can locate themselves on campus and, and learn a little bit of something without having to go on a guided tour um, with the historian. Um, so, moving right along. Um, so this project um, brought up some interesting um, management practices. Um, I think most of us would agree that a typical library project um, looks a little something like this. Um, you know, committee meetings, we're all sitting around a board table. Um, we meet twice a month from 1 to 3 p.m. Um, we <laughs> email in between um, if there's questions, but really there's not a whole lot of work that goes on outside of these committee meetings except for maybe a specialized task that we've been assigned. Um, so, so doing that, um, that's a very traditional way of doing things, but what we've learned is that working with students um, is completely different. Um, they work on completely different schedules. <laughs> <laughs> um, during the day, students are very structured. They have their classes, they have their exams, they have social activities. Um, their days are very full. So when it comes to doing side work, um, and a lot of these Deans Fellows are working up to 20 hours a week, um, when it comes to doing that, we have found that their schedules, they work maybe from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. They're not necessarily you know, on our same schedule. Um, some of the technologies that we chose for in this project um, allowed us to be able to work on these different schedules, and we'll be talking a little bit more about the technologies here in a minute. Um, but that being said, um, students also have a very different communication style. So they're on these different schedules. Um, we realized really quickly that email is, you need to wait at least a day or two before you hear back. Um, and actually, I had never even heard of Yo. I don't know, how many of you have heard of Yo? <laughs> I must be behind the curve on that one. Um, but, you know, in the library, we're typically communicating through email and occasional phone call. I, I prefer to call everyone, but <laughs> I don't know that they like that. Um, but, but again, students don't necessarily communicate as well through email, so we had to figure out different ways to work together on this project. Um, and that's where um, the different skill sets come in. Um, so again, this project emphasizes that students work with different library professionals. Um, 
and we all have different skill sets, right? We're, we're, we're working complementary to one, one another. Um, so in this specific project, we had three mentors. Um, Myself uh, working on the GIS component, um, Cliff working on um, the JSON and mobile technologies component, and our associate director of special collections working on the archival research. Um, again, this is complementary to one another. There's really no formal leader. Um, we're all just sort of working together and trying to guide the student in the direction they need to go to complete this project. So with that, Cliff? So, um, so part of this, uh, thinking about how to organize these projects brought up some questions that we have, um, you know, about how we organize our, our own work in, in libraries as well, and I think probably in the academy more widely. But I think this particularly applies to librarians. You know, typically, like, librarians are uh, in employer-employee relationships, uh, where they have a boss who tells them what to do and, and how to do it and when to get it done and basically how to get it done. And, you know, if, you, if, uh, if you're in that kind of relationship, you have a very structured environment. But when you're working with students, as, as we say, like they, they don't exist in this kind of structured environment. Um, and part of what we were thinking about is, like, should we try to teach students to work in these kind of traditional managerial hierarchies? Is that really what the future of collaboration looks like? Or should we actually start thinking about how to take some of the, the practices in working with students and start trying to change the way that, that we work ourselves? So, um, so you know, what we want to do is, is actually learn from open source uh, how to get projects done. Now, one of the things about open source projects is uh, they may well have leaders. Uh, you know, we can probably say, like, the, the person that uh, is most famous in this area is Linus Torvalds, who developed Linux. He's definitely a leader. He calls himself a benevolent dictator for life. Um, <laughs> so it's not that they're necessarily leaderless, but the communities are much more amorphous. People don't have reporting relationships. There's not a direct financial relationship uh, between Linus Torvalds and others in the community. And yet, they are able to make enterprise class software. Um, so there is clearly an effective way to work. And the, you know, so thinking about what we can learn from open source, what we can learn from community-based projects that operate in a sphere outside of uh, the, the managerial, um, that, was, that was important to us. And it was also, I think, one way that we wanted to, to model uh, the learning for the students. So um, what we did. Uh, we started thinking about, like, what, what's at the core of a lot of these projects? It's something called version control. Uh, how many of you are familiar with this? I don't want to belabor this point. Okay, well, let me introduce it a, a little bit. Um, uh, version control is basically software that tracks every version of what you've done. Um, and you can use it individually, but it's typically used in groups so that you can see uh, this person contributed this piece at this time, this person contributed this piece at that time, and so that everything that's being contributed to a project is being tracked and managed. And there are different types of version control. Um, traditionally, there's concurrent version systems with this little turtle here, and there's subversion. These are centralized version controls, and they work really well within a managerial system. So if everybody works with the same organization, and you can all check in together and talk to each other if you have a problem or by phone or email, uh, th these are terrific. Uh, but Linus Torvalds actually invented Git because Git, uh, he was experiencing real trouble working in a, in a collaborative environment with people he didn't know using these tools. They were built for the, the managerial systems. Git is built for a distributed environment where you don't necessarily know people. Uh, so Git turns out to be much more effective uh, for working uh, in distributed ways. Uh, and of course, GitHub is, is getting to be well known now. GitHub is, is built on top of Git. It's not identical with Git, but Git is at the core of GitHub. And it's a, basically a social network for co coders. And this is what we used to build our own system. Uh, so. so some of the tools that we decided to use, um, we're going to go over that. Um, I come from a background of heavily using ArcGIS. Um, how many of you have used ArcGIS? It's really desktopy. It's really clunky. Um, the online version. Um, incurs fees when you want to start using their geoprocessing tools. Um, so because of this and because we wanted to build something that was um, mobile, web app friendly, it was lightweight and easy to use, we decided to use um, a combination of Leaflet and Mapbox. Um, Leaflet is an open source JavaScript library with custom geoprocessing tools that are um, built for Mapbox, which we basically use to serve out our um, 
serve out our um, base map tiles. So the background that I showed you on the very first histor historical tour slide shows some really pretty imagery. Um, Mapbox serves that out and um, all of the um, geolocating features, which we didn't get to show you, um, are done using Leaflet. Um, so typically GIS data, at least in ArcGIS um, spe uh, specifically, is stored in a relational database. Um, but with this data standard that we chose, which is JSON, um, you need a document-oriented database. And Cloudant provides this um, as a database service. Um, it's metered, it's pay-as-you-go, but you know, considering the use that we had so far, we really haven't, we haven't incurred any fees yet. So um, you hit that limit and then they start charging you like a cent per something, um, but it's really, it, it's been free so far. So um, that was appealing to us. Um, so this was also good, good because we were able to get it set up on our own and we didn't really need any of the library resources to be allocated for this. Um, and another good thing about it, you know, working with students, it's hard to manage things. Um, anyone can go in and log in and update, um, update the database and, and push it out to the map. Um, so, and then there was one other point I wanted to make about this. Well, anyway, we're moving on. Um, we also used a, combina com a combination of open web technologies. Um, we chose the combination of Bootstrap, JSON, and HTML, uh, JavaScript, and CSS. Um, we used Bootstrap because it's a mobile-first web development, um, and it layers up to the desktop. This was important because um, we wanted it to be mobile friendly. We were most people will be accessing this on their mobile devices, um, so Bootstrap was important for that piece. Um, JSON, JavaScript, object notation. That was the data standard we chose to communicate. Um, and to communicate with our database, we used JSON P, um, and then sent an AJAX request um, to Cloud to pull out the data um, into the map. And then HTML, J JS, and CSS, um, we chose these because of the efficiency, they're easy to maintain, and they're compatible with a lot of different technologies. Um, <laughs> so w one thing about all those technologies is that you know, they're, they're, we didn't have to ask anybody's permission to use them. And this is, this is really key. Like, look, both of us work in the library. I'm a director in the library, but I don't want to go through the library's uh, uh, process of re requiring to you know requisition things if we don't need to uh, because it just takes everybody's time and one of the goals is let's let's try to reduce that time by using these open source and available technologies that people can start immediately with and uh, then we reduce our transaction costs uh, here um, <laughs> you know it's one of the things is I think in in general in thinking about uh, the way that open source works is it's really been enabled by reducing transaction costs to the point that you don't need to have the centralized hierarchies that you used to have to provide resources to you. And I think this is one way that we as librarians need to begin thinking. There are just a ton of resources out there that are available to us to build these kind of open source projects that we don't need to ask anyone help to, you know, maybe to learn them, but not to, to actually get started with them. So the person who's really informed my thinking about this uh, is this I call my guru. Uh, he looks like a guru, I think. Uh, um, it's uh, Yoki Binkler at uh, uh, the Berkman Center at uh, uh, Harvard University. But you know, he wrote a paper called uh, Linux, uh, Kosa's Penguin, or Linux in the Nature of the Firm, uh, which is a fantastic paper uh, written in 2001. And basically what he argues is we are entering a new sphere of work. It used to be that, that things were ordered either with managerial hierarchies top down or with contractual relationships. But now, with the peer-to-peer -peer relationships that are developing in the open source world, uh, we are able to, to do things that we're using our extra capacity that we, you know, we couldn't connect people that could work on these projects that ha all had a little bit of extra capacity. And that's what we're really trying to teach the students. Use the, the tools and the technologies that are out there already and learn how to connect with these communities. Uh, and also, I think it was a learning experience for us. Um, connect with these other communities that are outside the library and learn to use them effectively for library ends. Um, and I think that's pretty much where we're going to wrap up. Uh, this is just a bit of uh, recommended reading. If you really want to get into Yoki Binkler's thought, this wealth of networks is, is a classic that really talks about uh, the peer-to-peer -peer production process. Uh, this is more of a popular book, The, Starship and the Spy uh, Starfish and the Spider, uh, The Unstoppable Power of Leaderless Organizations, but again, focusing on the idea of the uh, open source environment. Um, as one that's not a managerial environment. Um, 
then these two, Race Against the Machine and Average is Over, you may have seen these books, they're kind of popular uh, uh, economics. Uh, but the point there uh, in the latter two as well is that we need to enable our students to think about how to leverage the networks around them in order for them to be um, productive in, in our new economy. That we, 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 you know, one of the things that we're thinking about is we want to model good behavior uh, uh, among ourselves so that uh, when students go out into the workforce, they can bring some of these ideas with them. And I, we've actually seen this happen. It's not just like a, a hope. Uh, I just had a student come back from a class I co-taught co in DH, um, a DH seminar uh, who came back and said, I just use GitHub in my organization and we use R all the time and I, all these technologies you were teaching me are turned out to be exactly the ones that, that we need in, uh, he's working for a GIS organization. So, you know, I, I think that uh, that kind of connection is, you know, the, the thing that really makes you glad to hear. Uh, seems like makes things worthwhile. And again, uh, that's sort of what we're trying to do and uh, we'll be glad for any questions. Thanks.